Hello, good afternoon, and I really appreciate you coming to listen uh, to my story about Ed Viram. So first, uh, my harbor, safe harbor statement, I will be giving some forward-looking statements, so I refer you to our public filings to get an adequate view of our risk factors. Okay, so um, the reason why I'm so excited to talk about Ed Viram is that we have really uh, incredible industry-leading capabilities that allow us to serve our patients. So first, on the platform side, we have unique proprietary development capabilities to make uh, second generation vectors. So we leverage both directed evolution and rational design to come up with these novel AV serotypes. And that way we can make them uh, more tissue specific and also have a better neutralizing antibody profile. So they can be more cell selective. In addition to the novel capsids, we also have capability to improve the cassettes themselves. So improving the promoters to be more cell-specific and targeted in terms of transgene expression. So that's where we are on the platform. And then I'm thrilled to be able to say that we have three lead indications marching their way towards the clinic, with the first one in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency targeted enrollment at the end of this year. And then next year, we'll file two INDs, one for hereditary angioedema and one for wet age-related macular degeneration. So very exciting on the clinical side. Um, in addition to the platform and the vector capabilities, we also have a good strategy when it comes to manufacturing. I mean, this is a meeting where people know manufacturing is difficult with gene therapy. Our strategy has been to excel at the process development. So we have the experts that know how to leverage both backlow virus systems as well as HEC-293 mammalian cell processes to manufacture the different uh, serotypes that are needed. We have it all the way up to 200 liter in-house, so that allows us to transfer the process to commercial manufacturers who have GMP facilities. So all they have to do is follow the batch, I mean, I say all they have to do, but as we all know, you have to manage them doing it. Uh, follow the batch records exactly, and then they'll come up with the material that we need to take into the clinic. So a little bit more about our pipeline. As I mentioned, the first uh, liver-directed gene therapy product for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, we aim to enroll patients at the end of this year. Um, hereditary angioedema, we will file our IND sometime next year, and later this year we'll give uh, more guidance on preciseness. And similarly, with uh, our wet age-related macular degeneration, it's important to note that where this stands out in the industry is that we deliver it intravitreally. And that's obviously big news to be able to deliver it intravitreally and have the protein express long term. It's also worth highlighting our partners. So as I mentioned, we have proprietary vectors. And in particular, the one that works delivering into the eye intravitreally was of quite a bit of interest to both Editas and Regeneron, who are trying to use their technology in the eye for particular indication. So I think it's very validating that they came to us as the company of choice when it comes to delivering proteins into the eye. So moving into the indications. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a rare disease. However, there are approximately 100,000 patients in the US. Um, the genetic mutation results in low levels of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin protein being expressed, which means you can't protect the lung parenchyma, and then you end up with progressive emphysema. So as you see, here's a patient with a cannula because it's difficult. They often have to walk around with oxygen tanks, and uh, little by little, they really do lose abilities in terms of activity. Um, and when you talk to the patients, some have had to progress into lung transplantation as well. There are products on the market, although they're difficult. So there's plasma-derived protein, which you can get IV administration once a week. And the idea is to keep your protein above a certain level to protect the lung. However, it does require a day a week, and that's what really makes it difficult for some patients to comply. And the worsening lung function does lead to early death. 
So we're excited that we have um, the potential to treat this disease with a single administration of ADVM-043. What we saw that with one administration, whether we did it intravenous, or whether we did it in chaplurally into mice, we saw the protein expression at high levels, which would lead us to believe it could be of therapeutic benefit to patients. In addition to seeing the protein level in mice that was encouraging, we also have data from non-human primates on messenger RNA, which shows that we have duration out a year, and they were sacrificed at a year. So the reason I am not telling you about protein in non-human primates is that the protein of the uh, primates is too homologous to that of humans, and we weren't able to distinguish between them. However, the messenger RNA level, which was consistent over a year, gives us the durability confidence. So with the, uh, the package in hand and an open IND, we plan to enroll later this year. So here's the data. And um, as I mentioned, we looked at, my, at wild type mice, injecting the vector um, on the left, on the far uh, graph, it shows when you inject it intravenously, and the other one is when you inject it into plurally, and it shows that we have, that once you get the protein expression, it's durable. You'll see that there's two orange lines, and the reason for that is that the lower one, the 570 micrograms per milliliter, that is the level that the products on the market um, achieved. So when they got their registration, it was based on uh, showing that they could maintain that level of protein in the serum of the patients. And that's based on work showing that that is the minimum level needed to uh, be of therapeutic benefit. However, the higher line, which is the 20 uh, micromolars and the 1.2 milligrams per milliliter, that's what normal people express. And the reason we put both lines there is that while we would like in our first generation and are encouraged to be able to um, hit the close to the 11 micromolars, we're really shooting for normalization. And that's why we really want to leverage our platform to come up with a second generation. So while we're very excited about our first generation, and I think it will be incredibly meaningful in terms of what we can achieve, we always have to strive towards normalization. So I think that's really why we wanted to uh, illustrate both lines. And you can see in the mice that we do hit above that normal level. Moving on to uh, hereditary angioedema, another uh, orphan disease. There are about 8,000 patients in the US. The, it results from uh, having a mutation and low levels of C1 esterase uh, inhibitor expressed. And when you don't have that inhibitor, you end up with sudden swelling and edema, and it can happen in extremities, it can happen in your GI. The GI swelling, I understand, is incredibly painful when you talk to patients. Um, it can happen, and if you see this patient, your face blows up, your extremities blow up. Um, it, it's a very debilitating disease in otherwise normal people. There are products on the market, however, right now it is challenging. So um, there are some acute treatments. So as you have the attack, you take the acute treatment, but it still takes a good 48 or more hours for all the edema to resolve. Or there's currently um, Synrise approved to, if you take two to three IV infusions a week, you can prevent the edema happening. And there's now some newly emerging products where you can go sub-Q to prevent the attack. However, with all of these products, while they really have made a, a big benefit to patients, there are still some breakthrough attacks. So this is um, the data chart, which um, is what we're excited about. Um, if you see the chart all the way on my far right, it shows that with Synrise, if you were willing to take an IV infusion every single day, then your breakthrough attacks would go down to zero. So that basically proves why you want to do gene therapy. Because if you could keep an even level of the C1 esterase inhibitor, you could prevent those breakthrough attacks. The graph in the middle shows that in wild-type mice, with a single administration of our vector, you do have expression levels above what's needed to prevent these edema attacks. And the two different lines are for female mice and male mice, and I'm sure people in the field would uh, echo that this happens not just with this transgene, but nobody has seen that translate to humans. 
And then uh, there's also a mouse model of this disease, but the mouse doesn't have the swelling, but it does have the vascular permeability. So the way you test a product's uh, efficacy is you give, it Evan, you give the mice Evans blue dye, and if you have the vascular permeability, you'll see the blue make its way out to the extremities. So as you'll see, the wild-type mice paw is, is not very blue when you put the blue dye in. The one in the middle uh, validates our disease model, so you do see the blue in the paw. And the one all the way over is a diseased mouse, which was treated one time with a vector. 24 weeks later, they were injected with the blue dye, and you see that it doesn't have the vascular permeability. So given the um, protein expression level where we want, and given the animal model data where we want, we had our pre-IND meeting with the agency and gained their support to move forward, and that's why we'll be filing the IND next year and we're in the process of our IND enabling studies. And um, for those who are familiar with the, with the backdrop and the landscape of this uh, products on the market, this is, while there has been huge improvements, this is something that would be incredibly meaningful to patients to not have to worry about sub-Q every couple weeks or IV a few times a week, but really just feel like they don't have to look over their shoulder and worry about a breakthrough attack, but they truly can live a normal life. Moving on to wet AMD, um, big market, over a million patients in the US, eight billion global sales. There are standard of care products that require intravitreal administration, either monthly or bimonthly. However, it is very hard to comply with getting an injection in the eye once a month, and that's what leads to the vision loss. This is where, uh, our data, and uh, let me explain what this is. So, so the way the, that you test products in the space is we uh, put laser, you laser the eyes of non-human primates to create lesions, and that's what mimics the neovascularization of wet AMD. So um, the big bar is the placebo bar, showing that when you inject placebo, about a third of the lesions that the laser created are grade four lesions, and they remain, which is what you would expect for this model, and that just va validates um, our model. In the middle is standard of care ILEA. So after you put the lesions in the eye of the non-human primate, all of the grade four lesions go away if you use ILEA. And very excitingly, in the orange circle, you see our data, which shows that when you use our vector, and then do the lasering of the eye, you basically eliminate just about all of the grade four lesions. I mean, you'll see one out of the uh, 97 lesions, but statistically, you basically eliminated it, and it compares exactly to standard of care. So this is incredibly exciting for the wet AMD population because this would avoid the need of continuous uh, intravitreal administration. More, uh, encouraging news is that there's duration. So this shows there's two different studies here. On the left, the uh, non-human primates that were sacrificed, that we left a couple monkeys uh, past the 28-week data, which I showed you before, and you can see that when we look at the level of a flibercept in the vitreous, it's consistent basically all the way out to 52 weeks. However, we do have a limitation on number of animals. And then we initiated another study, and you see that all the way out to seven months, we see consistent durability of expression. So this, combined with the previous data, shows that we have results like standard of care and that we have durability. So this is really encouraging for the wet AMD population. So with that, I am going to close, and thank you for listening to me. I'm very excited, obviously, about what we have, and this is a list of the upcoming conferences where we'll be speaking. And I think I have like 30 seconds for a question, if there's anything burning. <laughs>